And hey, good morning. Welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I am Ken Walls and I'm your host. And I just got back from a four day trip for a conference in Las Vegas and um, my body's still trying to catch up with the time zone difference. But um, so anyway, listen, today I have a guy on that I met recently through a mutual friend of ours in the UK. This guy is an entrepreneur. He's done a lot of different things. I'm really excited to have him on because he's got one heck of a story. Um, and so I'm look enough out of me. I'm going to go ahead and welcome my new friend and buddy, Tim Co all the way from the UK. Tim, welcome Hi. to the show. Thanks very much, Ken. Thanks for having me on. And, hey, and David for introducing us. Yeah, move, move a little bit to your, uh, you're kind of cut off. There you go. There you go. So, um, hey, so listen, I want to, um, you know, I, I created this show about a year ago. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was to help people. It's to, this show was created to help people have a breakthrough in life that are stuck. Because look, we all go through the crap in life. Life hits us sometimes. And dude, a lot of people stay stuck in the crap. They don't ever break free from it. And, and their time in the crap, don't they? What's that? I said a lot of people can spend most of their time in the crap. Most people do, right? Yeah. So, oh. so I, I, I want to, I want to talk about you. Let's talk about like where you were born and raised and what it was like growing up in Ireland. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty, yeah. Okay. I was thinking <laughs> the wrong bio. Um, so you want all that stuff? The early days? Say that, say that again. You, want all the, you, you, you like all the early days? Yeah. What's, where were you yeah. born and raised? Well, I was born in Bournemouth which is right on the south coast of England. Okay. And, um, and then I lived until I was seven in a place called Devizes in Wiltshire, which is famous for its brewery, Wadworth's Brewery. Yeah. And then I moved to Glastonbury uh, between the ages of seven and 14. Glastonbury is famous for the Glastonbury Festival, which is not in Glastonbury. It's about four miles away at a place called Pilton, but probably one of the biggest festivals in the world. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, it used to be, I mean, everyone plays there, everyone plays there. They had, Do they had Dolly Parton play, play there a couple of years ago. Whoa. Um, but no, everyone, it, it is, you know, if, you, if, if you're a band, uh, it is, a, it is a, uh, an, honor, an honor to be asked to play at Glastonbury. Wow. Um, spread over many, many fields, it's probably about, I don't know, quarter of a million people go every year. It used to be twenty-five pound for the weekend. Now it's probably a couple hundred pounds for the weekend. But um, and then you know, people used to break the fences. There's now enormous great fences. But yeah, I lived there. That's in Somerset, West Country, in um, in in England. And uh, and now I live in Limington, which is back further back towards Bournemouth. Limington is a little sailing town on the south coast of England. About sixteen thousand people. One big main high street. Georgian town built mainly in seventeen fifty. So I've got my office at one end of the high street. I live at the other end. And, so, uh, so, but let, let's, let's, let's talk about like, what was it like? Um, I mean, what kind of, like you went to school, you went to, I, I don't, in the UK, is it just, is it the same as here in the U S you have elementary, middle school, high school, and then university. I mean, how, how, how's that work there? Well, I don't really know how the English school system works, to be honest. I went to, uh, I went to, um, I boarded my last two years. I, from the ages of seven to 14, I was, at a, I was a day pupil at a school that was a boarding school. Uh, but I boarded my last two years, which was great fun. Um, so that was, you know, that, that, that was great. I mean, it was, it was a, quite a sports orientated school. Um, some people have heard of, a lot of people in the UK have heard of it, called Millfield. So I used to be a swimmer. Our swimming squad used to compete with all the main swimming clubs around the country. Right. Uh, we took us. We we teamed up. Our swimming squad teamed up with some uh, swimming clubs in Toronto and Montreal in 1982, uh -huh. uh, which 
it was a swimming tour we went on. So that was the first time I'd been over your way, so to speak. Um, a week in Toronto and a week in Montreal. I remember because the Falklands War was on when the Ar when Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands. I don't know if it was a big yeah. thing here. Yeah, yeah. To send some guys down and, and sort it out. But I remember it was that year because I remember reading newspapers at the airport uh, when I was on the way. Um, but yeah, it was a very sports orientated school, and we used to do sports on a Wednesday afternoon, on a Saturday afternoon, and later on I got into more into swimming. So I'd swim three, four mornings a week, half six on the poolside, and then we'd do weights and flexibility every lunchtime, and then swim in the afternoons as well. Let's say three afternoons. But so we did, 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 when you were in school, did you did you? I mean, what was it? Did you get in any trouble? Like, oh yeah. Did, oh, did not, you? <laughs> yeah, not bad. I mean, I, I didn't used to steal things or fight. Right. Not evil, but I was always getting sent out for laughing, for being cheeky, for you know doing silly things and getting caught for them. Uh, that used to annoy teachers. Yeah. So I'd see the headmaster sometimes. I was only ever going to get caned once, and he <laughs> let me off because he could see I was sorry. Um, but we used to have a thing called a report card. Yeah. So if you uh, if you if you'd messed up a few times, you'd have to go around with this with this clipboard and get it signed by a teacher at the end of every lesson. It had a bit of string and a pen attached to it. It sounds really prehistoric, and they just say how you did every lesson. So and then you'd have to go to the headmaster. And he would see how you were doing. So it just kept you on your toes. And then you have to spend all your break times sat outside the headmaster's office. Right, just right. Just watching everyone else enjoy themselves. Uh, and I had that. It, that was called a report card. I had that quite a lot. And then people used to get detentions as well. You have that in all schools, detentions. Um, not so much there. But I, was, I spent a lot of time standing outside for annoying teachers. I always remember the beginning of a school year. Uh, teachers like to sort of stamp their authority maybe at the beginning of a year. Yeah. And this, this guy came in and it was, uh, the class was um, religious studies. Okay. And the guy, uh, he came in and he, he sort of, he looked around, he thought, brand new class, I'm just going to lay it on the line to them. And he said, um, he goes, my name's Mr. Brain. And if you mess with me, you'll be hammered. Oh <laughs> my he, God. He slammed his fist out on the table and said, you'll be hammered and looked around at everyone. And the tension was too much, and I just, I just laughed like that, which was the ultimate insult to him. <laughs> but I was out, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and that was right at the beginning of a 45-minute lesson, so that was that was bad. That was a, that was boring. But yeah. Um, yeah, you know, school was good fun. It was mainly sport and mucking about. Yeah. Um, and. And learning, we had small classes, maybe eight, twelve, twelve class, yeah, which was good. But obviously, meant you know you couldn't get away with things. We couldn't get away with not doing homework. So, uh, so, but so, let me ask you this: so, growing up in the UK, yeah. and, and and you know everything I know about the UK, I've learned from our buddy David. Um, but like, that's what you think, then. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I, you know, like it's an island right? Big island, but it's an island. And, and so growing up there, I mean, did you travel to other European countries for vacation or, or what do you call it there? Holiday? Um, like, did you, did you go to other countries in, in the surrounding area? Did, I mean, what was it like growing up in the UK? Well, it's all I know. So it was, yeah. it, it was good. I, I, I remember long hot summers, yeah, you know. Yeah. I remember um, TV being better than it was now back then when we only had three channels. Yeah, <laughs> and now they're right. channels and they're just crap. Um, but, uh, sorry, growing up, but, sorry, there, was, there was something you said and I, I knew what I was going to say. What was it like growing did, up? Did, did you travel? Did you visit other countries and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I think I was quite lucky because my dad... My dad had quite a successful building firm, so we used to go on foreign holidays. You know, I remember going to Jersey, Malta, Spain, Holland, Germany, Belgium, uh, France. Wow. Uh, when, you know, when I was really quite young, you know, all before the age of 10, 12, that sort of age. Right. But, yeah. 
you know. But yeah, I've been to yeah, you know, I've been to probably been to Spain like you know ten times. Been to Ibiza four times. Um, there's been to Malta twice. There's certain you know been to um, been to France probably half a dozen times. So um, been to Scotland only twice ever, and that was in the last year. Wow! Which, wow! So so like when you that. what's that? Now that's up north. I prefer to go south where it's warmer. Right, right. So, so when you, you know, so you went through um, school, and I, I assume you graduated high school. Did you end up going to university or college or whatever it's called there? Yeah, college. At sixteen, we finish our normal school, and then you go to college for two years, and then university. So at sixteen to eighteen is college, or I think, that, yeah. And then after that, 18, 21, three years, which is a degree, university or polytechnic. But I was ready to get out and start my own things and, and not be uh, continuing on the education front because it really wasn't my thing. So you, you, did you, so you didn't go to university? No, no really? I didn't. I, I prefer to be a, a doer rather yeah. than, an, than an academic. I knew I was going to do my own thing and work for myself. So I didn't wow. focus on getting qualifications to get a job. Right. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't ever, you know, I was interested in music um, and unrealistically sport, football. Yeah. yeah. Remember someone said, unless you're the best in your school right now, you can forget that. I thought I'm not even the best in my class. Wow. <laughs> so I can forget wow. that. Football. Fo the... Football meaning soccer for my American. Football. <laughs> yes. We, we call it soccer here. I know you do, and, and funnily <laughs> enough, actually, when I was doing sport about eight, nine, or ten, we uh -huh. used to call it that as well. Really? Yeah, we did, and then it's just sort of been dropped, and it and it's and it's been football ever since. And then obviously, you guys call it foot, uh, call it soccer because you have your own football. Right, we do. But you don't really touch the ball apart from you do a bit of kicking, don't you? But yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Some teams have yeah. to kick more than others, but we won't go there. So, so, so you, so you went. What, what was the first thing you did? Like your own business? What was that? Coe's crepes. What? Pancakes. <laughs> What's it called? The, <laughs> the business was called Coe's crepes. 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 No, see, this is the D R E P E S crepe. It's it's French oh. cake. It's a thin pancake. A crepe. A crepe. Okay, that's another pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, that's also a shoe. Um, so sweet. Yeah, so that was my first business. Uh, sweet and savory pancakes, crepes, Coe's crepes, because that was my name, which I would never recommend anyone use their name in a business title, right. whatever. But, I was naive. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was my first business. So and was, to... was it a, a restaurant or were you like a street vendor? Yeah, I was a street vendor. Were you was... really? Yeah, a market store. So I was out doing um, uh, mainly markets at the weekends. Almost strong. I did some weekday ones, uh, but I was 18 at the time. And um, wow. so, yeah, it was, I mean... Up really early on Saturdays and Sundays, so it completely ruined my weekends. Wow. And I went 18, 18 to 21 is, well, some could argue, your peak for going out and having fun, and I was doing that. Um, but, yeah, it was a good good grounding in buying, selling, profit, stock, discipline, Yeah. other trade, other market traders, <clears throat> Uh, what you're going to sell, how much you're going to sell it for, right? that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, I've got very fond memories of it, and I did sell it as a going concern. And the girl who bought it from me actually ended up being on TV for a program about traders being ripped off at the British Grand Prix. Wow. Yeah. She Jeez. went. She went. I think she went to Silverstone, and she paid, I don't know how much money to to be at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone in about 1990. So Nigel Mansell, Nelson Piquet, Ayrton Senna, Prost years, those, yeah. those uh, early Prost years. Um, she was at the 
the British Grand Prix, and I think they put her in a car park or out the back somewhere, and she wasn't happy about it, and they did a documentary on it, I think. But that's where she turned up, um, which is quite a surprise. When you sell your business, you don't expect to see the girl. Yeah. At least she'd gone there, though. It was good of her to have the ambition to go to a Grand Prix event and be there for three days and sell, which I hadn't done. She was a bit older than me, but... So, so, so tell me, so you're making these, what do you call it? Crap. <laughs> they're, here they're called crepes I, is what I've always heard. But so, so you're making, you're ma is it, and you're like, you have a booth or something where people are walking up or how, how are you generating sales? Are you flagging people down? Hey, stop and get some crap. <laughs> well, yeah, we've got the best crap on the market. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, what I used to do was um, sometimes because you have two hot rings, two hot plates. Yeah. You pour the batter on, spread it around, put the spatula underneath, turn it over, and then yeah. when it's on the other side, you put the sweet or savory um, toppings on. Right, right. Uh, so just cooking them used to create business. Um, I soon realized that people didn't know what crepes were, so I had a, I had a sign made up, which is probably one of the first marketing things I ever did, was make a sign, uh, it was white, it was painted with red lettering, and it said, French style pancakes. So that ah. was the case to people, because quite rightly, they're walking along, they see a, a converted horse box, so it didn't look like a horse box, but they right. see a converted <laughs> with, a, with an open up window, and, uh, and it just says Coe's crepes. Okay. So, and for those of you that don't understand what he's saying, he means crepes, the thin little pancake things. He's saying, yeah. it sounds like you're saying crepes. <laughs> Coe's crepes and Coe's crepes. <laughs> it's a big difference. Uh, I, got, I got it, dude. So, so, so you're selling these, eventually you sell the business. What was next? What happened after that? Because I know you're still an entrepreneur. You've always been one. It sounds like, um, from our previous conversations, like w what, after you got out of the crap business, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say that with a straight face. I'm sorry. Yeah, that one. I've never heard that before. No. <laughs> <laughs> so after you got out of that business, you went into so you went into something else. What was next for you? Well, about eighteen months before selling the business, I'd started um, a courier delivery business. Okay. I had because I had a um, a pickup, which you would call a an SUV. Okay. We actually have pickups too. Okay, great. Yeah, so I had no gun rack in mine. <laughs> yeah, I, so I had a pickup. Um, it had a fiberglass hardtop on the back um, and a tow bar. So that's what I would use for towing my vehicle, uh, my, 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 my food trailer around. Right. So it made sense to try and utilize this vehicle. So I got into deliveries as well. Okay. So business mistake number two. Again, I used my name. So I had Coe's Craps and then I had Coe <laughs> Carriers. Wow. Which Carriers isn't a great name in this day and age either. So, um, yeah, so I was doing deliveries and uh, pickups and things like that. Yeah. Wow. So that went up. So that, when, when that business finished, I was 88. And, no, sorry. 86. 86 I started the food. But 86 to 89. Sold it around then. Wow. Yeah. And so not, then not, what? Uh. 86, yeah, sorry, 88, 86, 88, I started um, this. Let me just grab the uh, an old. Uh... Jason Hallen is on. What's up, Jason? Doug McCloy, Justin Jarek, Dan Kelleher, Glenn Caldwell. What is happening? Wow, we got some. Jason and Dan, hi, guys. So this, uh, Auto Gleam, the quick route to a great looking car. Uh huh. This was a business I started in 88. Uh, when I was 20. Mobile, um, what's that say? Mobile car valeting? Valeting. What's That's an, another French word. Valet. Oh, valet. Valet. So you, you use the word for the guy that parks the car. Right. That's what right. it is. Yeah. Well, it's also 
cleaning or detailing as it's now called. Oh yeah, we call it detailing. Yeah. So um so you 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 were a detailer. You had a detail. Yeah, so we'd have water on board, generators on board, pressure washers, all the cleaning chemicals and go to people's offices and homes and clean their cars uh, ready for sale. Ready for sale or ready for uh, the next business trip or whatever. I mean, we did people regularly. Uh, we did one-offs. Uh, so we used to advertise in Yellow Pages when Yellow Pages meant something. Right. I'd get sometimes five, seven calls a day from Yellow Pages, which wow. was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I look back on it and I think, it was so easy to get business back then. Because yeah. everyone, you know, there was just really one place to go. Um, so yes, that was a business I had for 10 years. Wow. And, um, I had about five vans at one point and we got into then, just one more, just got this. <laughs> Then we got into we got into doing this so so through detailing cars you naturally saw damage on cars like phone holes on dashboards yep. so, because car came in here well I had a car phone mobile phone in 1988 yeah um, so that was a thin vehicle phone windscreen damage alloy wheel repairs leather seats so then we started started this auto chips nice and stone chip repairs yeah yeah. What's a hey? So, what's um, what's plastics. a what's a windscreen? Um, I think you refer to them as windshields. Oh, yeah. oh, I got you. Okay. The glass. Okay, got it. Got yeah, it. Repairs. Fender repairs. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, so, different language, isn't it? Um. So so I had I had brand new vans and I they were brand new vehicles and I'd get them in the um. I was going to say the body shop in the paint shop. Yeah, it's like they're translating, isn't it? In the paint <laughs> shop, have them sprayed fluorescent yellow, like day glow, so they stood out mentally. Because my philosophy was everyone's got a white van, and yeah. everyone's put stickers on their vans to make you look at the van. Right. So to make the van a mental color, and people will look at it anyway and see what you've got written on the side. Right. Also, in the and it and it worked. You know, I wanted people stopping us at stopping at stopping us at traffic lights. And asking for brochures, and they did, and seeing our vehicles everywhere. So I'd get calls from people saying, Oh, I saw, you know, just naturally in conversation, I saw one of your vans the other day on Saturday afternoon working in so and so. Oh, really? We didn't have a job there, you know, and it's the guy doing a private home job on the quiet, but he couldn't, he couldn't do it on the quiet because the vans were so visible. Ah, uh, yeah, wow. All right. But so, yeah, that was so you did that. You did that for ten years, right? Yeah. What 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 happened from there? I mean, awesome. dude, you're like you're you're now you're what 30, 32, 31, somewhere in there. You're yeah. you're ten years into this. What was what happened after that? What was next? Well, I was thirty, and I thought. I have done my time working outside in the elements. Right. That's it. I, I, I mean, I didn't. I, I was only working outside for the first few years with the car valeting, to be honest. But then, with the, with the the, um, the smart repairs, I ended up working with another company after that. That was uh, they. They were a franchise company, and because I was going to franchise my business. Um, but back in 93, I ended up having a serious back injury and not knowing if I was going to walk again. Oh, wow. Yeah. What so happened? That, that came in the middle. I jumped over a wall. I was out one night in Bournemouth, just mucking about with friends. And um, I jumped over a wall and there was a 20 foot drop on the other side. Oh, my yeah. God. So I, I couldn't feel my legs for about three weeks. Oh my. I couldn't move anything. Wow. So that was worrying. Yeah. yeah. That's the biggest thing that's ever happened to me. And when you, we didn't even speak about that the other day, but when you spoke about setbacks in the life. Yeah. Yeah, that was one. That's a Here. huge, that's a huge setback. Yeah. So yeah. what, so w what did you do? I mean, did you, were you laid up in bed, I guess? Yeah, I was, uh, had a five hour operation. I've got some rods in my back. I crushed my vertebrae T12 into a wedge shape, which, uh compression on the spinal cord um i had to learn to walk again i was in bed 
I was in hospital for three months. I was in bed for seven weeks. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. And when I stood up, I didn't even know how to stand up. So you use those parallel bars. Yeah. You just don't know how to stand up straight, whether your, you know, your bum tends to hang out the back and you, you should I lock my knees? Because you just don't remember how to stand up. Wow. I had to learn to stand up and to learn to walk again. So I, I can't run now. I've got a bit of spinal damage in my right leg. I don't know if that was from moving when I was waiting for someone to find me because I was down there, I jumped the wall, I was down there for an hour. Oh. Uh, um, wow. So I, was, I could have damaged myself then. But anyway... Um, yeah, I was out in three months and, uh, on crutches and the guys that were uh, working for me at the time with my dad kept the business going and, and did a fantastic job, which wow. I'm just grateful for. And that was in the, the detailing business. Yes. In yeah. The, that was wow. December, uh, yeah, December, uh, 93, I did it. So good Lord, man. Wow. Except yeah, 12th of September, 93, I did it. But, um, you know, it could have been worse. I mean, everyone else in, in hospital, pretty much they were all paralyzed. Right. So I was in a spinal unit. So I was one of the lucky ones. I mean, people say, oh, you were lucky. Well, I was just lucky how I'd had my injury. You either have a bad fall or a, a not so bad fall or whatever. There were people there that had been paralyzed just from diving across the bed, stopped their son from answering the phone. Right. And just lack in a funny way or run into the sea and dived into a wave or fallen off a horse. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. So you, uh, man, you, 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 that, that's a serious setback. I mean, that's a serious setback. Oh, well, I live with it every day, Ken, you know, everything. Yeah. I couldn't get to sleep last night because my feet kept moving and I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. It was driving me mad. It was worse than normal. Wow. And it's, it's a hangover. It's something from a spinal injury where I just maybe once or twice a week, my foot will just want to come up like this and then go down again on its own. Wow. And it might, yeah. And it might go on for an hour, but it'll happen every 30 to 60 seconds. And I can't do anything about it. And you can't, you can't sleep. All you can do is get wound up. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Wow, Last that's... night I did actually get up about 4am and eat some peanuts. <laughs> but, wow. Uh, that's crazy, yeah. man. So you, so you, you, uh, like you were in the hospital for three months and, mm. and you, you come out of that, you come out of the hospital yeah. and, and your business is still going the auto detailing business. Hey, Megan, Wright. Megan Wright's on here. So, um, you come Hi. out of, you come out of the, the, the hospital and yeah. and then what? Because it sounds like that's about the time you got out of the detailing business too. No, that was I was only halfway through it there. I mean, oh, my dad, okay. I was still living at home then. My dad, I was twenty. I was still living at home. Yeah, I was twenty-five. Wow. I actually, okay. I moved out that year. I know that's late for some people to believe, to leave, but in my town where we lived, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, yeah. But to move out of home, um, but anyway. Yeah, my dad was about ready to convert the ground floor of the house into, you know, wheelchair friendly, which Jeez. was, uh, you know, wide doorways, roll-in shower, sort of thing to pull yourself up and get onto the bed and wow, crane, all that stuff, which was, again, scary for everyone. But I walked, I walked back. I walked down the pathway, not on a wheelchair, uh, when I eventually came home. So it was just a case of how you were going to recover. So from when I got back, I was running the business because I had a, a big shed at the end of the garden on the driveway, which is where I used to run the business from. Right. Um, just a phone line in there. No computers back then. Electronic typewriter, a couple of desks. A PA used to come in and help me because, you know, with all the PAYE, the wages. Right. Just hate doing that. Uh, <laughs> struggling with tax tables and things. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, we used to employ people properly and, and do it all above board and, you know, none of this cash rubbish. And, uh, you know, I was really pleased and proud that, you know, I could pay people's rent or mortgages and holidays and food with with the income from my business. And, and, and they had families and things. So that was quite satisfying um, in that time. So, yeah, it was just a case of seeing how the recovery went. Um, 
you know, it would it would improve, it would improve, and then the improvement would would slow down and slow down. And you thought, how far am I going to get? Right. You know, am I going to walk like this? Am I going to walk any better? So I can't run. People say, why do you want? So I, you know, I I can play a bit of tennis, but I can't run around. So I can't really do the sports I used to be able to do right. anymore. Swimming felt a bit. I felt, when I went back in the swimming pool, it felt like swimming with one leg. Mm. Um, if ever I get down about it, it's just say, look, you know, it could have been so much worse. Right. When I see somebody in a wheelchair now, I think, God, that could have been me. I mean, you could also be dead. I could be dead. That's 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 another downside of falling twenty feet. So I so. I lost the use of my arms. Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be really really bad. So so you yeah. you um. So you were so eventually though you got out of the detailing business and you got did didn't you get into the music industry? Yeah. <clears throat> that's sort of all the way through my life that's been there. Um and it it came out in in, in being in bands, playing in bands, uh, drums were my instrument mainly. Wow. I don't know why, because you know that that, that one question you know, if you could do anything, you were guaranteed never to fail. It was guaranteed to be a success. You know, you could do yeah. it. The, the, the thing, the answer for me instinctively was always to be at Wembley Stadium, standing out there with a guitar. With, <laughs> with so you, you you wanted to be one of the Beatles? <laughs> no, <Not> really, <laughs> never been a Beatles fan. You're not a Beatles fan? What was that? The the Beatles. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Um, uh, these are my groups. <laughs> Man, for not being able to walk very well, you keep getting up, walking everywhere, Tim. These are my bands. What? Hold on. Let me see. The Stone oh. Roses. Okay. Yeah. What's that? Oasis. Yeah. These are. This what, is. This what is kind the best. Of, what, what genre is that? There's no such. You can't pigeonhole bands like that, Ken. Okay, they, I won't then. Uh, well, if, if it wasn't for the Stone Roses, uh, there probably would be no Oasis. So they're probably one of the best albums of all time, 1989, the Stone Roses by the Stone Roses. And then What's the Story, Morning Glory, was probably, what was that, 92, I think that came out. Uh, what, what, so, what, 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 I mean, uh, what kind of music is it? Is it like classical, orchestra? Is it rock? Is it, what is it? Country? Guitar, country music? Guitar, bass, drums, singing. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> That's ridiculous. All right, so, so, so you, you, you were in bands. What, what, did you, did you have any success in the bands? Oh, yeah. We once played at the Rising Sun, and my mum was in the audience. Okay. That's just a pub. That that oh, the Rising Sun's a pub. No, oh. uh, no, yeah, we 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 <laughs> we not. I had more success um, in my DJing and, and and electronic dance music uh, career than than playing in bands. Okay, so playing in bands is great, but um, when I had my back injury, I couldn't really play the drums properly anymore because you need two feet. Right, right. Two ankles, two 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 yeah. punch punch the ankles. Yeah. Um, so. And also DJing, you didn't need a, you didn't need other people. You just could do it on your own. Right. And uh, I think I'm more of an individualist than a than a team player. You know, so DJing was was better for me. I think. Um, so yeah, club DJing, underground, tough trance, hard dance music, euphoric, uplifting riffs. You know, smashing, pounding bass lines and lots of percussion, 145, 150 beats per minute. Uh, clubs up in London. Um, played in South Africa quite a few times because I had a wife um, who came over here that I met and she was from Cape Town. So I went back there playing in Cape Town at Christmas every year, 2001 to 2005, which was good. But um, we used to make music, myself and a guy called Greg Brookman, who I met in a club about 6 a.m. in Brixton, uh, a place called the Bridge Bar next to a club called The Bridge. Yeah. Um, we started making dance music in about 2000 and... 
within a year or so, everything we made, we used to get signed and released. So we caught the end of vinyl. Wow. So we used to get, we used to get tracks, 12 inch single, produced, I can hear myself. You what? Nothing. I could hear myself momentarily your end, but it's okay. Is it better now? Yeah. Good. <laughs> anyway, we used to make dance music, get it released on vinyl, which was, which was brilliant fun. Um, so if I die tomorrow, at least I can say I have made a record. I've made so, quite a few records. Compilation CDs. We used to go on compilation CDs as well. But playing in a club was great, but playing your own music in a club yeah. to hundreds or thousands of people was fantastic. That's awesome, man. Yeah, so, that's some of the best stuff I've done. So, so you, did you, um, I mean, had you, when you got into that, that, I mean, had, did you still have the auto detailing business? Uh, in what, the music? Yeah. The DJing, now that, that, um, it was on the end of that. I okay. Think I sold that business in 88. I first sort of started to go proper clubbing, not commercial clubbing. I mean, underground clubbing, you know, was like, but the music was completely different. Right, right. Uh, music you'd never hear on the radio. Sure. Uh, I started doing that in 96. Okay. So I started, started DJing in clubs in 98 and did that for about 20 years. Stopped, they stopped a year or two ago. I played in Split in Croatia a couple of years ago. Uh, wow. no. so two years ago this summer, it'd be two years ago this summer, um, which was an outdoor gig. One of my mates, one of my best mates, uh, Adam Hempenstall from betterproposals.io. Great product to check out. You yeah. actually, you, we were yeah. Quite, yeah. You, it was a small world. Yes, it is. It is. He, he was organizing the, the, the pre-party to a big event called Ultra, which uh, I think there's Ultra in Miami. Yep. Uh, Ultra in Croatia. It's a worldwide big, big, big... Um, Club. Dance event. Yeah. Uh, there's another reason I don't DJ anymore, because the music is appalling. It's <laughs> awful. Um, so mu but music moves on, music changes. It does. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Yep, I know. So anyway, Adam mm. used to run the pre-party for this thing the biggest pre-party there and i went to play he, he, he wooed me with um large crowds and djing outdoors in in the heat wow but I, I'll, I'll do that yeah cool so what so so eventually though you you um i mean i i don't did you make millions doing the music stuff no it used to cost you right you know? The amount of traveling around you used to have to do. Right. You know, we used to spend we used to we used to spend a lot of time in the studio making music, and that means a lot of traveling, a lot of time. Right. A lot of a lot of time in record shops buying records. Uh, you know, listening to a hundred and buying maybe four. Right. Um, now you can do it all online, and download a WAV or an MP3, and you can listen to tracks quickly. Uh, but before you do, obviously, you have to go to a record shop and put them on the turntable back in the sleeve, get the next one out of the sleeve on the turntable, listen to it, you know, and that takes all evening or all day. And so, so it's hard what, to make, like, uh, what make happened up. though, as you, as you continued, so what, what was next for you? I mean, you said it was just a couple of years ago that you, you'd stopped playing, but ha is there anything that you did, you know, outside of that in the business world that like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was, that was just my hobby, oh. you know, it was fun. It was fun, but it was it was a hobby that I took really seriously because you know everyone used to say you're you're good at this, and I felt I was, and it was an area that I had probably more confidence in doing it than than most other things. So it was easy to do. Yeah. But business, you know, in the daytimes, I mean, that as well, Ken. It was a massive distraction. Right. Here with your business, uh, whatever it was. But um, I had businesses in property. So I used to source land, development land for property developers. Yeah. Um, and when I used to live, I used to live up in uh, Southwest London, a uh, county called Surrey for about five years, 2001 to 2006. Yeah. Um, and that was, as I say, sourcing land. And also we, I had another business that was in property that was helping speed up the conveyancing process. So when you buy a house here in England, 
They do what's called um, searches. So they search the local authority to make sure that they're not going to build a road at the end of your garden. Right. Or that, not, or that your garden hasn't got landfill underneath it for right. 50 years ago. Um, those sorts of things. Or, you know, what's the planning uh, position on your property? You know, if, if there had been five planning applications to build an extension and you buy the house and you want to build an extension and they've all been, re they've all been turned down, you'd be st pretty stupid to buy the house. So all these searches are done, but they were taking so long. So my business was about speeding up that process. Um, so I did that. I did and the property. So I had a couple of different property businesses as well, right. which led to a, the, the best one of all, which was when you buy a house, you have to pay what's called stamp duty land tax over here. Yeah. Always changing the laws. But I had a business where I had to save people 40 to 60 percent of this tax by working with tax specialists and selling their products for right. them, uh, selling them, they, 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 they used to want an introduction, but I used to actually sell the products for them. So every time I handed over somebody that this was a client ready to go, not somebody that's vaguely interested in saving some tax. So uh, let, let, let me, let me ask you this because you know, uh, we're, our, our viewers are dropping off. I, I, I don't want them to drop off. I want to keep this, so I, I, I want to I want to know, like, what are some of the things like, look, when you when you jumped over that wall and you fell 20 feet and injured your spine there, there was a there, there had to be a defining moment in there somewhere when they were telling you that you might not ever walk again, that you all of the, the things, the fears that you experienced, all of the what mental anguish you were going through. I mean, was there a defining moment? Was there a moment where you're like, no, this is not hap It's not ending like this. I'm walking. I, I know what you're trying to do. It's typical American thing. You're trying to Hollywood the story up, aren't you? No, I'm not trying to. And I'm definitely not a typical American. I'm trying to, to make, I honestly, I'm trying to find out if there was a moment because I think that every single person I know, and I know some unbelievably successful people, and and every person that I know, hey, mm -hmm. Frank Crenitti, how you doing? There's a guy that sells 100 cars a month. So like every successful person I know that's been through the, the shit like that, they've, they've all hit this point where they're like, okay, you know what? Enough is enough of this mindset. That has nothing to do with Hollywood. That's life. So, like, yeah. is there was there a moment for you where where you were like, I, I, I'm, I like they're telling you you can't, you're not gonna walk again. Was there a moment where you're like, no, I am gonna walk? Well, it didn't. It didn't actually come down to that. I was too scared to ask them, will I walk again, in case they hesitated with the answer. Ah, uh, so I never asked them. Gotcha. They, they never said you'll be fine. <laughs> right. I just remain positive. I just, you know, I've always had this never give up thing. You can only you can only lose out if you give up, you know. So, yeah. It, some ways, I still think I'm recovering now. So I still expect to get better now. Yeah. And this was five years ago. Not get better, but still improve. Right. So, I was, as I say, I was in a hospital with people that were paralysed and weren't going to walk. And in some ways, that spurred me on to get the hell out of there because it wasn't a nice place to be. Sure. I asked for ex extra physiotherapy so that I could speed up the process. Yeah. And um, I just, I mean, it, I, there wasn't a defining moment, Ken, to answer your question, but there was always an attitude of this isn't happening. Well, this isn't going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to walk out of here. Everything's going to be fine. Just get on with it. I mean, th yeah. but no matter how, positive you are mentally if you've got a physical spinal injury you know while i was in there christopher reeve had his injury wow Superman. right and he died yeah yeah it was money in the world couldn't save him right right injury but again it was a spinal injury he was paralyzed it was worse than mine but that happened around the same time he was a month or two after me i don't remember the exact date so let me check it wow but, uh, yeah <clears throat> And he, he, he was the original sort of film Superman, wasn't he? Yeah. Or even he was the oh, first. Oh, well. 
Yeah, I yeah, I think so. I don't I don't remember, but yeah. Everyone he he definitely him. was Superman. Everyone knows him. <clears throat> yes. Know, the Superman film. Who was Superman? I don't know. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So so yeah, it was all, always just always an attitude of, you know, just get on with it, push through, never give up. Yeah. Um, because you know, if you give up, everything starts spiraling downwards then. You know, you feel bad, you think you're gonna look bad, you look bad, you feel bad, it's just a vicious circle. So, so what 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 do you what do you do these days? These days, I help people get their message out, look good online, have the confidence to sell their products, build personal brands online, get more clients. I think they call it marketing. Marketing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Marketing. Um, but I have a. I have a, a, a unique angle, which is based on my book, Your Utterly Seductive Proposal. And I don't believe you can do any, even think about doing any type of marketing, even create a business card, let alone a video or a website, until you've got something completely unique to say or sell or deliver that nobody else has got or something that you can't get anywhere else. That's not always possible, but sometimes you can dress it up differently or add something on to make that to make it different make it higher value sure. and there's a load of reasons why you know you, you should have a unique product right but um that's that's my angle that's my thing um where's your book your, oh there it your, is yeah your utterly seductive proposal love make it your friends an offer they can't refuse love that man i love it awesome yeah. So uh, this is 50,000 words, 200 pages, uh, published it in March 2014, and it's all about the, re you know, the need to be individual in business, how yeah. to create indiv individuality, and then how to convey that to your ideal target clients in ways that you know help you stand out and get remembered, get you talked about. Um, the lot's changed in five years, marketing-wise, hasn't it? Massively. Sure. So some mm. of the stuff I hear about, let's talk about, you know, the difference between LinkedIn and Twitter. Yeah. It's embarrassing. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it, it, and it's, it's, it's going to continue changing. It changes yeah. rapidly, right? So, so yeah. let, let me ask you this, because we are, we are coming close to the end of this. So let me ask you, like, what do you think it is that keeps people stuck? I mean, because look, I know people that have been incredibly successful that hit a roadblock and, and it takes them into a downward spiral and they don't recover. I know people that, that, you know, just were born in a stuck family and they stayed stuck forever. Like, what do you think, what do you think it is, Tim, in your opinion, that keeps people in that, that place where they're stuck for life? Well, it, it, I mean, when you ask the question, can I think about people in business? Yeah. And, and I'm thinking that, that they can be scared. Just a simple thing of being scared, to going to a, scared of going to a networking event where you could meet the person that changes everything. That's going to keep you stuck. Yeah. And I also think it's, which is, a, which is a big thing I find, is people are scared what other people are going to think. People think that others are looking at them when they're not. You know, everyone's got their own problems and right. their own, everyone's consumed with their own stuff. Right. You know, I'm looking at the, you know, Bill's printers, analyzing whatever he's gonna do, and if he puts a new shop sign up or a new shop front with a new font and a new color, yeah. I'm not gonna kill the guy. I'm right. probably gonna notice it, but like people are, I often get kickback on some of my ideas. People saying, I could never do that, Tim. What will people say? Who cares? Right. You know, the fact they say something is great. Right. You know, it's great. What are you right. bothered about it for? They're not even looking. Why are you, you're concerned about something that doesn't even exist. So I think people play it safe. You know, everyone that you know in business has done something out there or done something memorable or taken a big risk. Yep. And um, people that don't do those things stay stuck. I think you know, they're either too scared. Sometimes it takes money. There's there's financial constraints. 
Um, you know, if I want to do a billboard ad, all a, a, bill, a series of billboard ads all across London, that's going to cost me some money, you know. But right. <laughs> it would be ballsy. If I was going to do it, I'd do something out there that people couldn't remember. But um, I just think it's, it's, you know, as I say, being scared and being scared of what other people are going to think. And if, if you can just, you know, have the, have the confidence. I mean, confidence is one of the biggest. I don't know why they don't teach it teach it in school, confidence. I mean, maybe if they did, everyone would be confident and, you, and you'd need to be extra confident to stand out. <laughs> right. Confidence, I think, is one of the biggest things in business. You know, the confidence in your own idea, the confidence in yourself, the confidence in what you say, how you say it, what you look like, where you go, who you speak to. There's so many things that you wouldn't do without any level of confidence. That's right. You're right. You're you know, right. You on social media if you weren't confident. Right. What would people think? Right. So, and I think the more confidence you've got, the more the more you're likely to do things. The more you do, the more you're going to get noticed. Yep. The more more conversations you're going to have. Um, so you know, you and I met last week. Yeah. And you said, "Let's have a chat now." Like, yeah, why not? Yeah. So we're on a video call for an hour. Yep, we were. It's not true. oh no, I can't. I've got to make an excuse, and I've got to go out. <laughs> and then you wouldn't be on my show. So like, like, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I, if, if somebody, let's say, uh, and, and I'm just going to give you a, what if, what yeah. if somebody called you up and they said, Tim, I've done everything I know how to do. I can't feed my family. I, my, my, my car was repossessed. My electric's getting shut off. I don't know what to do. I've done everything. What do you say in that moment to help that person get get out of that mindset of, of being stuck? Because that's literally being stuck in your mind, right? And I've been, I personally have been there. So what do you say to that person to help get them over that hump? Well, I think first of all, I, 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 just make sure that, you know, have you got all your limbs functioning perfectly, correctly? Right. Once we've established that they're healthy, and that's a bonus. They're healthy. Fantastic. At least you can do something about it. Right. If, you're, if, you're, if you're disabled, in bed, you're at a serious disadvantage. Yeah. So if you have your health, great. I'm, I'm not making a joke out of that. I mean, even though I am slightly making a joke out of it, it is the fundamentals to running a successful business, isn't it? If you wake up feeling crap, or if you fall asleep at 11 a.m. or 3 p.m., or you haven't got the energy to, to go to a meeting, that's a problem. Right. So health, you've got your health, great. Right, we can build on that. I mean, I'd want to know what they had done in business, but I think the fastest and quickest way to get new business is through your existing clients which, you know, you know that, yep. but people overlook it and they're too busy chasing new customers, yep. chasing complete strangers for business when they've got people there that they've done all the hard work with already. Yep, you're right. They well be having issues. I haven't bothered to call you for three years. That's embarrassing. They might be using somebody else, but the people that you know already that have done business for you and the people that they know, so it's your yeah. existing base and, and referrals. Because, you know, a hot, ref well, a warm referral is a lot more likely to convert than chasing somebody down on social media. That's where I'd want them to start. Yeah. Is look, you haven't got to spend any money going out and advertising and throwing some hope money somewhere. Yeah. Let's get back in touch with people that you've already done business with. And let's also, depending on the relationship strength, ask them about people that they know as well. Because that stuff doesn't really cost anything. It's a phone call and it's instant. Yep. You're right. Oh, so you're, 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 you're saying that <clears throat> if that person that's stuck owns a business, um, the solution to, to an immediate solution to their problems is sales, get revenue. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you, you can cut costs as much as you like, but you won't have much of a business and yeah, it's, it's all about the sales, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you haven't got any customers to go back to, because either you've never done any business or you pissed them all off, then you need to 
you need to think, am I cut out for business? Or maybe right. you're in the wrong business. You could easily be in the wrong business and go into something else. It could just be a different product that you need. Right, right. Sometimes you know, it just takes that little, little tiny tweak. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm tweaking all the time. Sure. And, and you know, thinking I'll hit on the, I'll hit on something, or th this can be better. Yeah. This could be of more use to people. It's all about helping people, in my, you know. And it's what can be, you know, what's an easy yes? I use the word easy a lot. Yeah. You know. The offer's got to be easy. The call to action's got to be easy. It's got, it's got to be easy to remember me. It's got to be easy for people to explain what I do. You know, they can refer me. I've got to be easy to, it's yeah. got to be easy to explain onto somebody else. And <clears throat> everything's got to be easy. It's got to be easy to use my website. It's got to be easy to buy something. It's got to right. be easy to buy it. Easy to get a refund or easy to understand the guarantee. Yep. It, all, all these things. So everything can always be easier. Um, but, you know, you... People are naturally lazy. Take the route of least resistance. Yeah. So if your sales process is 21 steps and somebody else's is seven and it's the same end result and you're the same price and, and you can see the path, I'll take the short one. Yep. You know, so because you want it to be easy. So, yeah, I'm always looking to make things easy for people. Um, Love it. Which is what problem... Which is what products are, aren't they? Things that solve problems. I love it, dude. I love it. So, so how can everybody watching this? How can they follow you? What's the best place? Uh, well, I probably put more content on Twitter than anywhere else. Um, okay. So, twitter.com forward slash tip. Well, Timco UK. Timco T UK. Yeah. Twitter. Yeah. You're obviously you're on Facebook. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, I'm awesome. on YouTube, I'm on the internet, I'm on Google. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, good. Yeah, um, and I, but most of all, I'm on the Ken Wall Show. <laughs> right? Breakthrough Walls with Tim Co. It's so Tim. Thing. They can find me on here. For somebody watching right now, that, that they're barely hanging on to life, wondering what this is all about, and okay. you have an opportunity to positively impact their life at this moment and help them get beyond this mindset that they may be stuck in, regardless of where, where they, like, what do you say to, what's your last words of, of, of wisdom that you would share to help somebody get out of the muck. Is this a non-business question? Just yes, a it's a life question. God, Ken, that's heavy. Dude, God. that's life, man. That's life. Life is heavy, man. And it's our duty and our responsibility to help other people, man. So what do you say to that person, man, to help them? I mean, dude, you jumped over a wall fell 20 feet, permanently injured your spine. You had to learn how to walk again. You've been through all this shit. You didn't bring some form of wisdom and power out of all that that you can share with somebody and give them some hope. <laughs> I broke my ankle badly three years ago as well. Dang, gone, dude. So what, what, what do you say to that person? What's some last motivational words you can give to somebody? Give me your hand. Let me help you up. It'll be okay. Together. Shit, sorry. I just <laughs> fell over. Give me your hand. Let me help you up. Together, we will devise a plan to make your life whatever you want it to be. And I'll sit with you and work with you to get it perfect. I love it, dude. Just I can do. Love, I love it. That's what I'm looking for. I can think of a cliches before that. It's not that I, bad. Hey, I, I, I hate people that think cliches are bad. Cliches are good. They help people remember. They get people on track. Yeah, cliches are cliches because they're true. Yes, and they work. Yeah. Tomorrow's another day. Right. Every cloud has a silver lining. It's not <laughs> that bad. There's someone worse off than you. Right. 
All true. I didn't want to say those things. All true. I say, hey, just imagine if you had to give a best man speech in 10 minutes. Oh, my God. Yeah, but you haven't. Things are great, aren't they? I said, I could say that to him as well. Right. Right. What do you want people to, what do you, what do you want your eulogy to be? Right? Like, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Because that's the thing, Tim, is I, I think people don't really understand that. I think the human ego does not understand that it's going to die. This body, this body is going to expire. It's, it's horrible, isn't it? I've actually got it on my phone somewhere. I went to... I don't um, know if it's horrible. I don't know. I know somebody that died and came back, and she says it's pretty spectacular. So, I don't know. Well, I've, got it, I've got it on my phone somewhere. I did a did a uh, course called, called True Color Balance a few years ago with a guy called Andy Edwards. In called Portland. what? What's it called? True Color Balance. Okay. I was cut. I was I was drinking from that was from the event, but it was all about you know the four personality types, different colors, yeah, finding which one you are, that type of thing. And one of the one of the exercises we had to do, Ken, uh, during the evening, we had to stay in the hotel for a couple of days, uh, a couple of nights uh, for this event. We couldn't go home. Uh, it was in Bournemouth. To mention Bournemouth again, yeah, in Bournemouth, about what twelve miles from me. So one of the things we had to do was to write out what would be read out at our wed. Uh, Funeral, the yeah, eulogy yeah. at our funeral. So I had to sit and write all that out. I remember just doing it all on my phone. Um, wow. And it was about going off in a boat. People saying he was mad to go out in that in that weather, but he did. We never saw him again. <laughs> but he went down doing what he loved. <laughs> Jumping waves in a fast boat with loud music playing, <clears throat> screwing his head off probably. But, that's uh, dude. That's see. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I love it. Hey, listen, we're at the end of the hour. I want to say thank you, Tim. You're amazing. You're a good dude. Like we've had some really in-depth conversation and, and outside of this and, and you just, you're a good dude, man. You got a good heart. You're a good person. I, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me on. It's been great. Been yeah. Good. So everybody make sure you go follow Tim Co. in over in the UK. So, um, Tim, thank you. Appreciate you, man. Don't hang up on Skype. Don't hang up. But thank you, guys. Thank you to everybody who shared this out. Thank you to everyone who's watched and been on here. I appreciate it. And we will see you all very soon. Tim, thanks again, brother. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go get his book, Utterly Seductive Proposal. Yeah, Tim, Timco.com. Timco.com. Appreciate yeah. you, man.